Hello everyone. I've been feeling slightly less unmotivated than usual recently, and while the Academy is all well and good, I would like to branch out into some other formats. Let's see where my options lie. Damn, I wish I knew how to groom. I've wasted vast portions of my life on video games, and I don't plan on stopping, so I figure if I just start occasionally saying interesting things about them, all those lost hours can be chalked up as a business expense, and I can sleep better. But while I've dipped my tingers in nearly every genre, there's one I keep coming back to. Hi. My name is Sam. I like roguelikes. I really like roguelikes. There's just something about them. I like their perks, their builds, their systems. I like to be taken by surprise. I like it when they call me trash as they beat down on me, feeling a sense of progression in the back of my mind. I like... Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I got myself all worked up. Would you like to help me cool down? And as a nerd, I also like bitching ad nauseum about the inconsequential minutia of all the things I claim to enjoy. So strap in while I present my half-baked opinions to you as objective, universal truths. First, let's get one thing straight. What exactly is a roguelike? Well, that's a contentious question. Many of the games I'm going to be discussing could be classified by some as roguelites. You see, roguelite is a term invented by the Unix Unix of yore as a way to condemn the innovative as second-class citizens. Settings besides generic top-down dungeon, blasphemous pollution, real-time gameplay, go back to COD, you worm, cross-genre influences, you are high on crack cocaine, permanent progression systems, foreskin privileges revoked, using a tile set instead of learning to to read the ASCII matrix, the West has fallen, billions must cope. To me, roguelike means random levels, get the loot, die forever, do it again. Well, that's it. But if using a T instead of a K makes you feel superior, then I can't stop you. Semantics aside, roguelikes are, at their core, strategy games. While some more time-sensitive skills can come into play at some point, ultimately the fate of a run rests upon those careful calculated decisions at the crossroads in between the action. Now, the ideal scenario for the player is for every decision to be completely informed, but total information at all times leaves us with chess. A fine game in its own right, but besides a couple notable spin-offs, chess is not a roguelike. Unknown enemies, environments, and potential rewards are a fundamental part of the genre. Please keep these hidden. If I can read ahead, I will, and then all I've done is spoiled the adventure of the hour. However, there's a major difference between intentionally withheld information and ambiguity. Ambiguity arises specifically from a failed attempt by the game to communicate the info required to make a strategic decision. This is technically a video essay, so while I'd love to just ramble pointlessly, I do feel the need to make at least one thesis statement. So here it is. Smell my lips, meatbags. If I encounter an item or ability, and a description of it is given to me, I should not have to then check a wiki to find out what it does, or how much of that thing it does. That last clause in particular is important, because if there's a trade-off present, I'd rather take big good and small bad than small good and big bad, and without numbers these are identical, making the choice moot. And if there's no trade-off, then there's no point withholding anything anyway. Give me the stats. I crave the digits. I yearn for the data mine. Let me show you what I mean. This is Undermine, otherwise known as the Binding of Spelunky. This was my hyperfixation of the week a couple moons ago, which means it automatically qualifies for the Salmonella Certified Not Dog Shit Hall of Fame. But boy oh boy do I have a bone to pick with some of the item descriptions in this bag of code. This first one was actually the straw that stepped on the camel's crack for me, the one that led me to make this video in the first place. Here's the scenario. So I jumped down the hell gullet, and waiting for me was Zork, with his dragon penis conveniently out of view, as usual, and he offered me a shiny trinket in exchange for three major curses, which is an absolutely crippling price to pay. I says to him, I says, this must be something special. Let me whip out my gamer loop and get a closer look. I found out it was called Nullstone, and it stops damage once in a while. This? is fucking worthless. The left button is a stop damage once in a while button, because sometimes there is danger to the right. If I'm forced to take a wild guess, I'd say once in a while means around 20% of the time, right? This is not a game where you can go around soaking up enough hits for the law of averages to kick in, meaning, were this the case, there's a fair likelihood that this item would end up not benefiting me whatsoever. Nullstone indeed. So given what little info I have as a player, I would never dream of eating three major curses for this, and by consequence, I'd never get it, so I'd never find out what it actually does. Unless I check the wiki, which thankfully has info on this little mineral. Turns out, it actually blocks the first time you would take damage in every room. Still don't know if I'd take it personally, but that's still a much more fair deal than what I was picturing. But I understand that not every dev has my innate prowess for accessible explanations of technical subjects, so allow me to suggest a subtle but effective rewording.
This game is teeming with shit like this. Here are some highlights. Lucky charm, a chance at avoiding death. This is just real life, at all times. Are we talking taking a shower odds or rabies odds? Wiki's no help other than that it's low, so no thanks. Kurtz's box, a mysterious box that invites calamity. Yeah, I'm good. Not a fan of calamity. Not too keen on his friend's catastrophe and cataclysm either. I like my skies high up and my oceans liquid. Call me old fashioned. In reality, you just get a pile of mid doodads after picking up 10 curses, which you'll probably do anyway, so this is fine. Birthing pod. Consumes all healing until birth. What the fuck did you just say to me? Is this like you can't get health till the end of the game and then secret ending, big reveal, it was all a uterus the whole time? Its real name is Underminge. Now, it's actually you can't get health until 500 health, which is crazy, and at the end you get a second pointless bird. Utter goon stain of an item. Call me Planned Parenthood, cause... Let's talk about Risk of Rain 2, one of the best games I'm complete dog at. It's also guilty of normalizing half-assed descriptions of things just because everyone's gonna Google it anyway. Let's start with the mid-run item descriptions. These can range from the occasional numerical description, to at least a vague indicator of what it does, to literal fucking flavor text. These can mostly be forgiven because A, the effects of these items are usually intuitive enough that over time you can get at least a subjective feel for how much they benefit you, and B, barring the lunar stuff, most items only do good things, meaning you're not going to instantly tank your run over a few suboptimal choices. But here's the baffling part. There is a different set of much more precise descriptions for every item in the game. You just have to access them through the logbook in the main menu. These provide actual numbers and aren't that much longer than the text scene mid-run. So why not take this and put it here when we need it most? Some player abilities suffer from a similar fate. This is Acrid, the loathsome reptile that squirts sewage after jumping due to rectal incontinence. This sewage applies poison, which of course is a damage over time effect. However, his unlock alternate passive allows you to substitute this poison for Blight. According to in-game descriptions, whereas poison applies a powerful damage over time, Blight deals 60% damage per second. Powerful, 60%. Powerful, 60%. Green, yellow, two syllables, one syllable. There's actually a bunch of differences between the two, the main ones being that poison can do percent max health damage if the enemy is sufficiently tanky, but it doesn't stack and it's better. Whereas Blight does flat damage, can stack to the moon, and is based. Is any of this adequately explained? Not a chance. Nor are the other two main damage over time effects, at least not in a way that meaningfully distinguishes them. To all this, one could say, who cares, damage is damage, fondle plant. And in plenty of games, I'd be inclined to agree. But in Risk of Rain, my goal at all times is to break this bitch wide open like an oyster with a rock. If I am I'm not intimately familiar with the tools at my disposal, this precludes me from exploiting their quirks in sufficiently disgusting ways. Of course, once a rain cell really starts risk maxing, worrying about things like proc chains and coefficients, I will concede that a few clicks are hardly an inconvenience. While including the individual proc stats for things would be nice, I think a baked in half hour lecture on exactly how they work would be just as much a burden on the player as on the devs. But what about games that haven't yet had every possible digit and formula meticulously scraped out for all to see? Neon Abyss is a side scrolling dungeon crawl which is discussed surprisingly little given how polished it is. Though the gameplay is nothing revolutionary, the set and setting are worth noting, with the titular Neon Abyss representing life in the information era. The bosses found here are all heavy-handed metaphors for how different aspects of modern society ostensibly control us. Celebrity worship, materialism, superficiality, burger, shitcoin, gun, commoditization of the human experience, wheel. And while I get what they're going for, the messaging comes dangerously close to the sort of reactionary phone bad sentiment you see see an out-of-touch Facebook memes. Although I wholeheartedly agree that the odds are stacked against the individual in this world designed to foster and exploit an endlessly growing thirst for instant gratification, something about how this game goes about it kind of rubs me the wrong way for some reason. You know what, let's see who these anti-capitalists really are. Ah and the plot thickens. I'm suddenly finding myself a bit less receptive to lectures on how I'm living in a dystopia. Matter of fact, I'm a little offended. That's our damn me clown you're making fun of. Now that I've started what will surely be a civil and well thought out discussion down below, let's get back on topic. Neon Abyss is actually quite a fun game, but it too is hindered by ambiguity. The largest and most coyly piece of dog do is that, prior to picking up an item, you are given precisely diddly fuck in the information department. So unless you've sunk enough hours to memorize the effects of every weapon and trinket in the game, your choices can basically be summed up as, hmm, which one will help me more, sphygnomanometer or expired dog food? Well, one sounds like fancy technology to those who haven't Googled it, and the other is expired dog food, so I'll go with the former. Oh good, I've just traded mid but potentially build-defining perk for minor buff only applicable to a very specific build, and only accessible if you have no health. You know, that thing that kills you in almost all circumstances. Getting to know each item is further complicated by the amount of redundancy in the item pool. Over 300 items exist in the game, and of them, 
those, these groups do the exact same thing according to their descriptions. Maybe the numbers are a little different, but with zero concrete data to go off from either the game or the wiki, one must assume these are either functionally identical or just grossly imbalanced with one another. All that this bloat achieves is making it so it takes more hours and skull space to get a clue. This could be avoided by reducing these down to one item and making it stack, but the crazy thing is, there is already a class of stackable items in the game, some of which also do the exact same thing as these wastes of a PNG. I get you want to reference the funny chili dog mammal, but please, spare me, just give me the circles. There is one character whose special ability lets him see item descriptions beforehand, but the trade-off of just not benefiting from hearts is so brutal that, by the time you're good enough at the game to make him even viable, the insight he provides is no longer necessary. So although he can in fact use the smegmometer, you're better off just playing someone stronger anyhow. Moving on, we all have fond memories of late 2021 when that Italian guy figured out that all we need to have fun is slot machines and genocide. Evidently, aiming has always been a relevant fluff, but vampires survived so Brotato could thrive. Let me tell you, I love this man. I'm a butt of the spud, adulator of the tater, YouTuber, me YouTuber. Check this out. Basically every item in the game gives you information about it in explicit, quantifiable terms. As a side note, the fact that most items have a downside is actually really cool since it essentially forces build diversification. Not just that though, take a look at the stats screen, which is accessible at all times. Ugh. This is a thing of beauty. Every variable, scalar, multiplier, any and all applicable stats laid out bare in stunning HD. I'm bricked up in a wooga-ing at the mere thought. No more wondering if stacks behave additively or multiplicatively. It's all reflected in the numbers. This is what happens when games are made by players. This is what happens when your project team isn't bogged down by some UX designer with a minor in lumber sexuality, who's so jaded by their previous experiences in IT that they assume that any consumer presented with something more complex than a leap pad is gonna shit their Crocs and relapse on Elmers, which is a fucking rampant problem in modern high-budget titles, but that's a story for another video. The point is, this should be the absolute standard. These numbers already exist in the code, so it really doesn't feel like a big ask to just have them printed on screen. Is it pretty pedantic to prattle on this long about something a lot of people don't care about? Absolutely. But often, it's the pube-counting turbo dorks like myself that make up the dedicated core of the player base for games like these. So if there are any aspiring devs watching, I hope you'll take my message to heart. That's all I have for now. If you've enjoyed this video, please join me for part two, where I will be scraping the algae from a fish tank and freebasing it. Thanks.